subsequent to that, she's been doing a postdoc that is joint between WITS and the Zico Museum in Cape Town, uh, which continues looking at the Cape Superdome uh, in terms of fossil and geological content. Um, but I imagine this talk is entirely geological. Yes. Great. Oh. Um, good day, everyone. Thanks very much for, for pitching up for the talk. Um, so thank you very much again for introducing me, Zubair. Um, you did a good job. Um, so as Zubair said, I'm looking at the Borkevalk group uh, of South Africa. And my uh, talk is entitled Looking with UCT-Driven Environmental Change. So it's pretty much um, global sea level effects on envir the environmental record of South Africa during the Devonian. So if we consider the Devonian period, um, the, the, these animations, what they are pretty much showing you, is that by large, there were, were two large supercontinents, Gondwana towards the south and Larissa towards the north, as well as these other microcontinents, Siberia, as well as some other ones which I've um, left out. And what this is showing is that throughout the Devonian period, Gondwana migrated up northwards towards Larissa. Um, sometime during the Emsian, the Riek Sea, which separated Larissa and Gondwana, closed, forming one of the, fir well, one of the earliest Pangean belts. Um, were part of the Appalachians, and what we see as well through time, the Paleotethacy uh, started closing up in a scissor like fashion, so did the Euralian Sea, and there was one large ocean uh, which went around the Earth called the Panthalassic Ocean or the Proto Pacific, depending on uh, names. Um, climates during this period, climates for by large were equitable uh, throughout the Devonian period, so we can see a tiering. Uh, through time of uh, arid, tropical, subtropical, warm temperate, cold te uh, temperate and uh, uh, environments through time. What we can see is that uh, the paleo gradients or the paleoclimatic gradients were shallow um, throughout, um, you know, closing up towards the late Devonian. What we can see is that you start developing this cold spell as well as these debatable early tillites which uh, were a precursor to the uh, Karoo Ice Age or the, the Carboniferous Ice Age towards the end of the late Devonian. Um, why well, study the, the Devonian period? Just to orient you, South Africa was located at high uh, latitudes, so 60 to 90 degrees south for most of the uh, Devonian period. During this time period, uh, early land plants made their appearance, um, which later towards the end of the late Devonian diversified into these uh, large arborescent proto Um Insects also ventured onto land as well as arachnids. Uh, ammonites make their appearance in uh, the marine realm. Um, true sharks, bony fish, uh, which include ray fin fish and fleshy fin fish make their appearance as well. Alongside older orders of placoderms, um, uh, errant aspids or uh, um, these jawless fish, as well as acanthodians. Uh, but towards the end of the Devonian, these guys went extinct, unfortunately. But what is also interesting about the Devonian period is that one lineage of these fleshy fin fish diversified through time, leading up to tetrapods. The first tetrapods made their appearance, you, me, um, and most, uh, uh, well, all uh, the terrestrial vertebrates are tetrapods. So we made our um, appearance as such uh, by the end of the late Devonian. Um, what also happened as well is that with this diversification of life, um, there were changes in um, environments and ecosystems. So what we do see as well is that coral stromatoporoid reef, uh, reefs made their largest um, aerial extent on Earth ever, uh, well, biogenically mediated reefs um, towards the end of the Devonian period. And you, you can see they went into decline, decline and the late Devonian extinction. But what's interesting as well is that the rise of terrestrial uh, plants uh, created, resulted in afforestation of land. So through time, we went from these very simple, um, low vegetated environments through time into these first forests. Now, this had great ramifications um, uh, for life on land uh, and also environments on land is that we had a change from braid plane type environments uh, through to increasingly more meandering type um, environments with, uh, if you think, roots form um, uh, stabilization of soils, or also the creation of soils occurred during the Devonian period with the rise of land, uh, pl uh, plants, and there were, of course, changes in um, biogeochemical uh, transfers, which have been in place ever since. Um, 
as well with life is that it was the last real time where we saw um, these biogeographic ranges of um, where certain animals or communities of animals existed in discrete populations um, in discrete areas on Earth. By large, there were three area or three biogeographic realms: the Old World realm, which hovered around the equatorial latitudes; this Appalachian or Eastern American realm, uh, which was in more temperate regions; and the malvino caffric realm, which uh, you know the critters that were around here um, were malvino caffric in um, in nature. Um, and yeah, the collapse of these large biogeographic realms took place at the end of the Arfelian. Um, no one really knows why or what happened, uh, why there was this change and then went over to more cosmopolitan fauna, which we see later, or went through. Um, also during the Devonian period, uh, there were a series of massive, uh, or series of minor um, extinction events, as well as, or we can go towards the end of the Devonian, as you can see, just looking at invertebrate families, is that there was this increasing extinction rate that went up uh, through time. And there's some evidence to suggest that the rise of plants um, and the changes in biogeochemical, trans uh, uh, biogeochem biogeochemical transfers as well as changes in environments um, resulted in this. So understanding what happened, and this just shows the uh, plants themselves change from these very basic uh, plants, simple plants, first forests, first seed plants, tetrapods coming at the end, which are animals, so yeah. Um, so, looking at the Devonian period of South Africa, um, we've actually got a very nice record. Um, it extends the yeah, topmost table mountain group, the entire Borkefeld group, as well as the lower Wittenberg group, and the dubious Imster Kaba formation, um, which uh, used to be part of the Natal group, but now it seems to be linked uh, through to the Cape Super group. So, why should we study these rocks? Um, well, by virtue that um, a lot of the information that we have on the Devonian period is from uh, more low latitudes. We don't really know what was happening, on, uh, happening at these uh, high polar to subpolar latitudes. So this is, it forms a very interesting um, uh, field of study or place to study is that you've got a nice good uh, record. It's low hanging fruit, not many people work on this stuff. And in South Africa we're also fortunate as well is that um, you know, it's very easy and accessible to get to the star crop. If you go to South America, it's vegetated um, under, in Antarctica, it's snowed under. And the Falklands, where the Fox Bay Formation, as well as the uh, Port Stanley Formation, parts of it are covered by minefields. So, hell, you know, wow, it's great. So, um, this is um, the problem that we have got with uh, the Devonian period in South Africa is that we've got very, very poor chronostrategy chronostratigraphic constraints um, on there. So this is from work that I've just done recently where I've used fossil assemblages because we don't have anything like ash tufts, unfortunately, to date the stuff, as well as polynomorphs. These rocks are being caught up in the Cape, uh, uh, the Cape Fold Belt, um, part of the Gondwana, the Rogenine, even though it's lower green schist fasces, for some reason there's some strange preservational bias that we can't get microfossils or palynomorphs that would have otherwise aided us. So using these, tra these uh, various fossils, I've managed to come up with a sort of constraint, age constraints uh, for these uh, successions. Down here, we don't really know. There's no fossils down here, so it's very tough to try, try age data. But generally, our fossiliferous uh, successions are about late Emsian to Fermenian in age. So it constitutes you know, a fair whack of time that we can look at. Uh, and then paleo environments are so essentially marginal marine environments, siliciclastic. So uh, there were no carbonates, um, well, there's no evidence for, there are no carbonates, uh, large shell carbonates or reefs uh, down south. So looking at these important finds from the Borkefeld group, the Borkefeld group is perhaps best known for its uh, endemic fossil fish assemblage, which um, is in the process of being, you know, formally described, properly described. Trilobites, as well as these other crinoids, other invertebrates, which are malvino in, uh, in, um in flavor. So they are only found here no, uh, or in southwestern Gondwana and nowhere else in the world. We've also got the earliest known, or some of the earliest known terrestrial plant fossils from Africa are found here on our doorstep, and not many people know that. Um, going up to the, the Fermenian, the Witpoort Formation. The Witpoort Formation is, is a virtual, it's a, it's a treasure trove of uh, fossils that have been found here. 
the earliest known uh, Archaeopteris or proto-gymnosperm trees have been found here. You know, otherwise, they're, they're found elsewhere at more temperate uh, uh, latitudes, but they were down south here. The world's earliest known lamprey, earliest known uh, fossil scorpion uh, from Gondwana has been found here, as well as these other um, algal fossils which were precursors to terrestrial plants. So we, we have got some cool stuff here. It just doesn't really get as appreciated. So taking us through to the Borkefeld group, just to orient yourselves, there's the Cape Fold Belt. Borkefeld group um, outcrops from about, 20, uh, about 21 degrees east all the way out, uh, I mean, uh, all the way out east towards 26 degrees east. There are two large sub-basins. There's this Western Clan William sub-basin, as well as this Eastern Agulhas sub-basin. And these basins differ from one another, uh, difference in thicknesses as well as lithostratigraphy that differ the two. But the age constraint that I've given you is probably late Emsian to somewhere in the Javetian, um, probably mid-Javetian in age, but we'll get to that later on. Um, what's nice about the Borkevalt group is that, especially if you work out in the Clan Williams sub-basin where I work, structural deformation is very low. These rocks have just been tilted over towards the east. Structural deformation is you know, low. Vegetation is very scrubby, so what's amazing is that you can see you've got almost complete, we've got virtually complete outcrop from base to top, and it provides an excellent place to actually study uh, these rocks in detail. What we can, what we do know, and which is also cool about the Borkefeld group, is that these lithostratigraphic units are, you can trace these sandstones out right across the basin, as well as these mudstones right across the basin. Um, and at first I didn't believe it, and I spent three days walking along one contact, uh, or hiking and camping, and eventually I just turned around and gave up. It's like, wow, this could be, um, I should have just believed people in the first place, but, and seen it but on satellite photos, but, you know, always a skeptic. Um, so the lateral continuity of these, um, these units were first thought, uh, the earliest models by Tehran um, in the 1970s, excellent survey geologist, um, was that the reason why these units are laterally continuous is that they represented a series of uh, laterally amalgamated storm and wave dominated del uh, deltas. So um, these deltas would come out from these highlands and they'd be reworked right along the um, if you look here, this is the paleoflow profile distributing these sands all along the coastline, which led to this idea that, okay, maybe, maybe these are just all amalgamated deltas. It was only later on in the 80s that a paleoenvironmental um, uh, model was put forward with the Lithofascius code by uh, Tankard and Barwis. And essentially what they recognize is that you could split this up into about uh, four, to, four to six different uh, discrete environments. Shells representing lower shelf pro-deltaic pro environments, moving up into distributed mouth bar environments, probably um, within the, the uh, delta front, moving up into, into distributed rays, tidal, tidal flats, as well as this beach shore face complex. So as you'll notice as well, when we talk about deltas, we're not seeing any delta plane type fascias, <coughs> and the, the reasoning for this was that they were just reworked. Um, as well as with the subsequent, um, this represents one uh, coarsening upward profile within the Borkefeld group. The reason why those uh, topmost delta plane environments were missing is now the idea that was put forward is that they were transgressively removed. But the standing idea is that when you're in deep marine or deeper marine environments, you would see these sort of settings, siliciclastic type settings with all these little uh, hokos and nunus that were living here. Um, in these environments and moving up towards land. You see there's evidence of plants, very simple um, plants that were just taking root on land. So for my research, I worked in this part over here of the Clan William Subbasin um, in the Cedarburg region. Uh, this is just a map that I mapped out uh, in the area. And when we look at it in these mountains, there's the Borkefeld group over there. And you can see it's got a characteristic hogsback type topography of these uh, uh, Lomo shells, sandstone shells, sandstone, these repetitive cycles that show re seemingly repetitive cycles of sedimentation. So just to look at the lithostratigraphy. So again, shales overlain by sandstones. And previous thinking is that each of these shell sandstone couplets represent um, uh, probably allocyclic um, deltas 
that prograded into the basin uh, after subsequent transgressions. As you can see, there are about six, or previous thinking was that there are six main uh, or six regressive events within the Borkfeld group. So I went out and I remeasured these sections, uh, re-described these, uh, these units, uh, looked at everything, paleocurrents, uh, changes in grain size, rock type, fossil distributions, and trace fossils. So at three study sectors, so this of course is north moving towards the south. This is a stratigraphic profile that I came up with for the Seri subgroup, which is the lowermost portion of the Borkevall group, and that is the Bido subgroup, which overlies it. Um, so it was a hell of a lot of section to measure, but I got good quality data, so I'm not complaining. Um, so what I noticed is that there are about eight, well, there are eight lithofasces associations, um, and there are 12 lithofasces in total, and that we can um, group them into larger depositional systems. So um, storm, these three are, of course, storm and wave-dominated shallow marine depositional system. This comprises offshore environments, which grade upwards into offshore transition zone, distal lower shore face, proximal lower shore face, as well as upper shore face beach environments. Uh, transgressive barrier lagoon depositional systems, channel, which comprise channelized tidal flats, which grade up, well not grade, they're transgressively eroded by transgressive beach barrier environments, and then wave influence deltaic depositional systems, which uh, we only see the pro delta, distal delta front, and the proximal delta uh, front environments. So we'll start with the uh, storm and wave dominated uh, shallow marine depositional systems. And what this is just showing is an eco-stratigraphic correlation of all of these environments across the basin. Um, this lateral continuity really is, is something that is really, really cool in the field, is that you can walk along these environments for days um, uh, trying to observe any lateral fascist changes. Um, by large, they constitute about 60 to 70 percent of the, the Borkefeld group, um, bar for the Trotra and Boerplast formation. Um, this is a diagram that I made from all the, uh, available information of what a typical upward coarsening profile would look like of distal offshore marine uh, shales which grade upwards into um, when you start intersecting storm wave base going into offshore transition zone, distal lower shore face, proximal lower shore face, upper shore face as well as the beach as well as the trace fossils that I found in the area. So in the fields Upward coarsening profile looks like this once you get your nose on it. Um, it might just all look like horrible rock to you guys, but I see rocks differently. And that's what I see. I see this lowermost part here, offshore transition zone to distal lower shore face. These non amalgamated sand bodies in and among these, uh, these sandy shales, which increasingly amalgamate upwards into proximal lower shore face sandstones, which are overlain in turn by upper shore face beach. Um, environments. So offshore shales, they, they're really boring. There's not much going on here. They're shaly. Um, but uh, what is, there are some things in there. We've got in places these laterally continuous uh, carbonate uh, horizons. They can either be tabular or nodular. So there's just a picture of what a nodule looks up uh, close. We also see sometimes that there are these thick sandstone bodies which um, seem to be transgressive or not, uh, seem to be regressively or regre seem to have regressively eroded into these shales and then of course subsequently transgressively onlapped. But what's interesting as well is that in places you find fossils. So this here is a trilobite that I found. This here is a brachiopod bed that I found. And we also have these trace fossils of here. This is Cochlichnus up there, Diplocriterion. This year's Paleophycus, if you look at those little squiggles over there, and this squiggly little bit over there, that's Helminthiopsis. Um, so what these are telling me is that they are uh, indicating that these offshore shales, just based on these assemblages, that they were relatively well oxygenated. So they were part of the probably Zoophycus uh, ichnofasces. As we move up the succession, um, one starts finding these uh, quartz wackies, which are, you can see over here, some cross beds. So we start seeing these non amalgamated hummocky cross stratified uh, quartz wackies which come in, which are indicative that we are shoaling upwards, we are moving into the offshore transition zone environment. So, moving to the offshore transition zone environment, we see a change. We start seeing these quartz wacky beds that um, um, that's, uh, sharply intercalate these units is Mike Bertie for scale. 
um, he is sleeping. And yeah, so again, you see these heterolithic laminated uh, sandy, silty sandstones with these non-amalgamated hummocky cross sandstone beds which permeate through it. And then up close, this is what one of them looked like. Um, uh, over here, just to show, this is showing some hummocky cross stratification within these heterolithic uh, units, which are indicative we've got more wave, uh, storm wave activity coming through. And then in detail, looking at one of these, um, these bodies, we can see that there are also wave ripple laminated uh, units within these hummocky cross stratified non-amalgamated quartz, wack uh, quartz wackies. Um, in places as well, this here is the basis of our Boenberg formation, we also find these things that look like channelized bodies. If you don't believe me, there's an interpretive diagram where we see these nice channelized bodies with these Levee sandstones, which come, um, which are, of course, laterally continuous to them. Um, so there's just one up close. We can see wave ripple lamination in there, which indicates they're probably subaqueous in nature, as well as if we look up there, this is just a close-up. We can see there's some reworking hummocky cross stratification within these units. So this indicates that at least some of these, there are some channelized beds which, um, which existed at this time. Um, in terms of fossils, you get these shell beds uh, with, with highly damaged and disarticulated fossils it's in very turbulent storm-generated uh, environments, which is natural. Um, find some autochthonous, um, I mean, allochthonous um, plant fossils. I mean, autochthonous, yeah, uh, plant fossils that were, of course, blown into the basin. Trace fossils indicate as well uh, a Cruziana type echnofasces, but I won't go into detail on that. That deserves its own talk, the trace fossils. <coughs> then moving up into the proximal lower shore face, that's to show you the green over here shows the distal lower shore face, blue proximal lower shore face, and then the orange uh, indicating uh, the upper shore face. What we can see is that these sandstone bodies, as one moves up from the offshore, from the distal low shore face into the proximal low shore face, is that these storm beds tend to amalgamate. This is indicating, uh, this indicates overall neck regression, uh, or just between those two beds over there. Um, and of course, these hummocky cross beds are quite well amalgamated. You also start seeing the appearance of um, a special form of hummocky cross stratification called um, anisotropic hummocky cross stratification as well as swaley cross stratification which is typical for these more proximal um, storm environments. Um, on the tops of some of these swaley cross stratified uh, units, um, this is just showing a topographic globe. So you have these high points, hummocks, and these low points, these, show, uh, these swales. You can see over here what the red is indi indicating is that we've got these lag beds that are, have collected uh, within them. But what's also interesting as well is that we can see these intrabreches that have actually impacted into the top bedding plane. So we know that these were extremely turbulent type um, environments as well as some potential prod marks over here as well as some meandering and real erosion marks on these, uh, on these high points of these, uh, these um, hummocks. And again, trace fossils over here indicate um, probably moving from a, as we are showing upwards, moving more from a Cruziana type echnofasces into a Scalithus echnofasces, which is typically indicative of uh, higher energy conditions. Um, these beds typically are also very, very packed with trace fossils. I mean, so much so that these beds are completely homogenized, so you can't actually see primary sedimentary structures. You can actually see that certain of these individuals, whilst they were alive, seem to occupy, you know, distinct parts within these, um, within these uh, sandstone beds. And again, showing us more moving away from um, Cruziana type ethnofasces to Scalithus ethnofasces uh, fossils, which are normally, so you can see these little pipes over here, these are Scalithus uh, fossils, so things that tend to burrow downwards are Scalithus. Uh, then moving into the upper shore face and the beach in the fields, it's always a, generally a very sharp contact. So this shows you yeah, these are upper shore face beach deposits. These are proximal lower shore face deposits. And you can see there's quite a sharp contact. You can also see as well sometimes what happens is upper shore face beach deposits overlie offshore transition zone or just the lower shore face uh, deposits. And yeah, you can actually see the erosional plane going through there. Uh, these beds typically are... At, um, are typified by interbedded um, trough and tabular cross bedded sandstones as well as uh, uh, upper plane laminated uh, quartz aronites. 
So in this picture of here, this is just an interpretive sketch showing this interbedding in here. And you get these very large uh, dune fields um, within these, these beds. Uh, trace fossils over here are also very rare. Um, there's, there's something weird going on in the Borkerfeld group is that you're switching, um, you're switching from Skeletus type ichnofossils to Cruziana, and I don't really understand why um, this has happened, but we'll figure it out one day. What's also interesting in some of these beach deposits, we see um, plant rhizolith fossils. So this here is just showing uh, an interpretive sketch of a uh, rhizolith that is uh, or a root in life that penetrated down into one of the probably backshore type environments as well as these impressions which are interpreted as possibly being uh, leaf and lamina type um, impressions. Um, we've also got these colified plant fragments uh, which sometimes uh, one finds in these beds as well. Then moving on to transgressive barrier island lagoon uh, environments, these are found in the lower to middle Tratra formation. Um, so just to orient you in the field, that's where we are looking at over there. So you can see there's a shell over here and these two sandstones. Um, so th this is the next major depositional system that one sees. Uh, so diorama just to show you what uh, they look like. So of course you've got a lagoon, which is part of the, this back barrier complex, which is protected from wave action by a beach barrier complex. And in the fields, looking at these channelized tidal flats, in the field, again, you start seeing these non-amalgamated sandstones with interbedded with uh, silty shales. But when you actually put your nose on them, they don't look like um, uh, distal or shore face deposits. These individual sandstones have mud drapes on them, um, which I've interpreted these possibly being uh, tidal channels and these overlying heterolithic laminated silty sandstones as being uh, showing uh, tidal channel abandonment, so moving onto the tidal flat. A uh, few trace fossils. This here is of a ichnogenus called uh, Diplocriterion. So you can see these pups that are dipping towards the right of the image. Um, and yeah, and also start seeing these laminated, um, these laminated quartz wackies, again with these mud drapes on them, indicating some possible tidal activity. So some slack water phases um, responsible for those mud drapes. Um, when we look at these transgressive beach barriers, these are actually, uh, these are actually quite, um, quite something to see in the field. So this here is of a new unit which I've proposed recently to SACS, uh, the South African Committee for Stratigraphy, that one can trace out from northern Cedarburg all the way out to Taronsburg Pass, which is just around um, uh, Ceres. And it's this very prominent, sa prominent sandstone towards the north that manifests as one sandstone which towards the south bifurcates uh, into two sandstones. And you can see that there are these two distinct upward finding cycles once one puts their nose on it. Now looking at these deposits in our crop, they are, they are by large look like that, very lumpy, very ugly at first. You know, there's no sedimentary structures whatsoever, but we do see these cycles where we've got these conglomeratic lags um, in between each of these distinct bed sets. In places where um, when one does um, see sedimentary structures, one sees these low angle cross stratified units with wave ripples or hummocky cross stratified sandstones, which seem to peek through. So at first when I looked at it, I thought, no shucks, these must be proximal lower shore face deposits, which were bioturbated, more intensely bioturbated. Um, but when I looked at them again, uh, there were some things that were weird. Um, this picture doesn't do it justice, but there are these things that look like plant rhizoliths as well as some plant stems that one finds in there. We've also got these um, brachiopod communities, and you actually get fine detail uh, preservation of soft tissues so of spiralia and the or harder brachidium, um, as well as scolithus ichnofossils, uh, these things that look like cylindricness, and gastrochenolites, thalassinoides, and planolites. And I looked at these and I thought, no, the, the ICNO assemblage doesn't make sense. You've got these things that are indicating terrestrial type environments, these things of here that are, or gastrochenolites, hard ground type environments, those things that are like beach sands, which are, um, which um, uh, solidify um, soon, after, soon after sedimentation with uh, precipitation of calcites. Um, as well as these marine organisms and marine trace fossils. So I thought, no, this is very weird. 
Then I looked at um, interpreting them as possible um, beach barrier environments. So if we look at a normal regressive beach barrier model, essentially what they look like are, um, are beach, they've got a beach profile. They've got a proximal lower shore face moving to upper shore face into beach type deposits in a normal regressive model. But in transgressive models, if we look over at, at when uh, one undergoes transgression, wave base rises and what actually happens is that the top of the beach barrier gets cupped off, reworked, some of the sand thrown into the back barrier and some of the, the sand being uh, thrown back into the uh, offshore environment as a um, distal low shore face or low shore face deposit. So I thought, oh, maybe then this makes sense. And so I thought maybe this is a model to try explain why we are seeing hummocky cr cross stratification and also no sedimentary structures in this mixture is that these, this uh, Kruit River member is actually showing reworking and uh, subsequent burial in places of this beach barrier. But what's interesting is that as, some, as these batch beach barriers transgress, they cannibalize the back shore or these back barrier complexes. So what's actually happened is that these, their contact is quite sharp. It's actually transgressively truncated some of the lagoonal environment. So you can actually work out of your, how much shore face erosion took place. And this is probably the scenario that we're looking at over here, where a lot of that succession is missing. Uh, then overlying this are deltas, which also don't, don't seem to make sense. Uh, deltas overlying them, which going from the upper Trotron to the Boerplas formation. So just to show you there, we've got these pro-delta, um, distal delta front environments, which are over here, and these proximal delta front environments, which are the main Boerplas sandstone. Um, so I looked at these sedimentary structures and I thought, no, these, are pro these look like they're wave-influenced deltas, so you get different flavors of deltas. And essentially, this is due to uh, the interplay between fluvial, um, fluvial energy um, as well as tidal energy and storm and wave um, energy. So you actually get a spectrum of them. So this is showing you as a typical uh, river-dominated delta. This is the Mississippi Delta. Um, and if we had to look at these profiles of here, we'd see these nice pro-delta environments, these subaqueous uh, channels, as well as these distribution mouth bars, which are these little point bars, which would be over there at the tips that receive some reworking from uh, wave action. Then moving to the other end of the spectrum, uh, this is the Nile Delta, which is a typical uh, storm and wave dominated delta. And what essentially happens is that all these deposits, all these fluvial deposits, deltaic deposits get reworked into something that looks like a shore face. And of course you get something in between, which is a, a storm and wave influence delta is that you, you see some of both. And just to show you, this diagram shows distal most pro delta moving into delta front and then eventually into delta plane uh, type environments. So in the field, this is how it manifests, uh, looking at the pro delta to distal delta front. You've got again these non-amalgamated uh, quartz wackies which internally um, look like they could be channels. They've got this very channel-like shape to them. Uh, they're sharply into bed among these heterolithic laminated silty sandstones. We've got some hummocky cross-stratification or some of these beds are hummocky cross-stratified with wave ripples as well. So this indicates that these were subaqueous. They're moving upwards into the proximal delta front environment. So this shows the, this is yeah, at swipe crunts. There's a person up there for scale. There are these large cliff faces of these channels which are amalgamated. There's a change in grain size. They go to um, uh, quartz aronites. And this is just an interpretive diagram showing you um, each of these individual beds. So actually what we're looking at now is we're looking, the depositional dip is going that way. Um, so it's coming towards you. And these are these individual um, um, dunes within these channels that are migrating downwards. And this is the same bed in a different outcrop at right angles. And we can actually see you've got these large channel features with these point bars that are migrating towards the center of these channels. Um, and yeah, sometimes these things are quite rich in uh, codified plant fossils. And here you can actually see the, this bed is almost black um, from all of these codified plant fossils. In fact, swap crunts is called swap crunts. Because uh, I suspect, even though no one's demonstrated it, that these, these could be very early coals or precursors to coal, which makes sense for that uh, time period that we should be seeing it. 
So I thought, no, this is, this is more of confusing. Um, how, do you, how do you get a deltaic environment which overlays a beach barrier environment? So I looked at these, the stacking patterns of these environments, and I looked at uh, the sequence stratigraphy of these environments, and I thought, well, if we had to go back to the Hex River Formation, this lower part, which is a beach environment, it seems to indicate um, that it was incised at one stage and reworked during a forced regressive phase. Um, and then, you know, you create a, a paleotopographic feature, um, a valley as such. And then with the subsequent transgressive phase, which the, um, which the lagoonal deposits as well as these mud are indicating, is that this valley filled up. So I thought, okay, the way to explain it is that there was these two depositional systems may have been a storm and wave dominated estuarine type environment. It's just that we're not seeing the bayhead delta during transgression. What we are seeing is the regressive equivalent is this delta which prograded southwards uh, during regression. So I suspect that one of these days maybe we'll find these bayhead delta deposits if we move up towards the north or essentially with transgression is that these, this beach barrier could have cannibalized these bayhead delta deposits. Um, it remains open-ended. We'll, we'll maybe find an answer someday. Um, so what I did as well was I looked at the stacking patterns of these environments and I, I came up with, and I looked and I thought, saw that I could compartmentalize um, the entire Borkefell group within a series of sequences. Um, so I used uh, transgressive regressive sequences, so looking at maximum regressive surfaces as sequence boundaries. Um, and what I noticed is that we could actually split these sequen uh, the succession up into sequences, and that these sequences, by and large, can be traced right across the basin. So there was something that was influencing, um, influencing these depositional trends in the basin and it's something that was uniform right across the basin. So I managed to split it up into second, third, and fourth order um, stacking patterns. So second order being most intense, going to fourth order, or not most intense, largest uh, changes in depositional pro uh, profiles and trends, down to fourth order, which was smaller. So second order depositional trends, um, I looked at using sequence boundaries, which were composite. Uh, maximum regressive surface and a trans with, a, with a transgressive ravinement surface. And generally, it's to do with large changes in paleo environments. So moving, in this case, if we look at the Trotra, uh, sorry, at the Hex River and the Trotra Formation, having beach deposits, which are, um, and upper shore face deposits, which are directly overlain by tidal deposits. The Boerplas Warbornback Formation, where you've got these uh, proximal delta front deposits, which are directly overlain by offshore transition zone deposits. And up here at the Osbach Karua Port Formation contact, where one has these um, beach deposits, which are overlain by offshore transition zone deposits. So these things are seemingly, to, to a sedimentologist, we go, that's, that's a big change. Um, in an environment, it's seemingly paraconformable. It doesn't, seem, it doesn't obey Walther's law. Um, so I used these and I found that there are, uh, uh, there are four distinct um, second order uh, trends. Moving into third order trends, um, just uh, looking at maximum regressive surfaces where these things coincide and of course fourth order surfaces which are smaller trends. And what I actually managed to do was work out a relative sea level curve at different orders. So second order, this shows the largest changes in sea level trends. We had maximum transgression uh, in the Gado Formation, shells the Gado. The Tractor Formation, these lagoonal, or lagoonal slash estuarine possible deposits. And then here I'm moving up into the Karua port and not shown over there because I think it's been transgressively eroded. I mean regressively eroded by the Blinkback Formation. Um, these offshore transition zones to offshore shales of the Kuruaport and Vakan Drift Formation. Um, so you've got these, these three major, or sorry, four major there. Sorry, I forgot about the Vagornbach Formation transgression over there as well. So essentially what it's showing is that when this graph moves towards the left, there are periods of transgression towards the right, periods of regression. So that's the second order. There's the third order trends that one can see, then these fourth order smaller trends throughout. So there were a hell of a lot of sequences over here. Um, 
And this now brings me to my talk. So back in 1986, um, uh, Mike Cooper, uh, I don't know how he did it, still to this day. I, whenever I go visit my grandmother, I go, he stays around the corner, so I go and visit him. And uh, he still tells me that he managed to figure out, correlate the Borkefeld group with the global sea level curve without anything, but just using the distributions of malvino caffric realm fauna, as well as these black shales. And remember, these are shown conodont zones, which again, as I explained, we don't have microfossils or colonomorphs. So he actually managed to age date the entire Devonian period based on global eustatic trends. So, and when I asked him, how did you do this? He said, I read. Uh, I read books, I read theses. And I thought, sure, you know, I'm gonna start reading theses in more detail. Um, so yeah, he showed that um, we could compartmentalize the Borkefeld group within four, um, four uh, global sea level events, one C to one F. So, I took his chart for the Devonian period, I put uh, where he showed his, these, these global third, where these global, where he predicted these global third, third order trends should be, next to mine, based on my age constraints that I gave the Borkefeld group, and what I saw is that shucks, there is some correlation uh, if we're looking at comparing second order to third order global, and even when we look at um, third order changes uh, to these smaller uh, third order changes is that we are seeing similar depositional trends. So it, it was, it just boggles me how he came up with this. Um, so this is what I'm trying to test now is just to say, look, there, there seems to be some possible control. But what is even more amazing as well is that if, I, if, you, if one has to take third order stacking pattern trends and then from Paleo flow vectors, uh, so I used wave ripples as well as um, hummocky cross stratification trends and that. I managed to work out shoreline orientations. And what seems to indicate is you, once you're moving up through the pile of these sort of order changes, is that so if we look over here at the Kato Kamka formation, shoreline envisioned shoreline trend that I've got over here strikes in that direction. We move up next to the, uh, uh, the Fuerstel Kix River, it changes over. The uh, Trotra Boer class changes again. The lower Warburg formation changes again. Wuppertal formation changes again. Klopokop behaves itself. And the Osbach formation changes again. So, you know, I thought to myself, shucks, you know, if you've got major changes in shoreline, it, it can't be global eustatic changes, it must be something possibly tectonic causing these major trends, major changes in shoreline orientation. So I then consulted my good friend Clarissa Foster at UJ. She recently did her uh, PhD looking at the trichal zircon population, so the Cape Soup, uh, for the, uh, pretty much, you know, it's a big PhD that she did. I mean, all of these, um, these low Paleozoic units in, in South Africa, South America, as well as the Falklands, looking at their detrital sourcing signatures. And I thought, okay, maybe I should see something, there should be something over there. But what's interesting, if you look at the Clan Williams subbasin, it was being fed sediment from, <laughs> from all sides. And I thought, no, 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 I'm buggered. Then I went and I put it on a map. So I thought, you know, Hannes Teron, that survey geologist who came with the original paleoenvironmental model, he always showed the Clan Williams subbasin as an embayment. He looked at more sections than I did. And he always used to say to me is that, um, looking at Isopac maps, is that one can see that there's this bend towards the top of the, the Clan Williams subbasin, is that it must be an embayment, that there must be some way to, uh, to demonstrate it. But so what I did was I looked at the... Um, the shoreline orientations, and I saw that you actually can, there are two distinct populations, uh, one trending northwest, southeast, the other one striking uh, northwest, south, yeah, northwest, southeast, other one, uh, northeast, southwest. And I thought to myself, okay, maybe we do have an embayment, but what we're actually seeing are different sides of the shoreline at different times. So what's actually happening is that relative to the observer, one time we've got this shoreline orientation over there, another time we've got that shoreline on top of us. So that this, this must have been moving back and forth through time. Um, and that's something that I, I feel that Eustacy couldn't control. It must be something tectonic. 
Then what I did was I looked at well, right. Well, let's look at um, let's look at regional tectonics of uh, Gondwana during this period time period. Um, Maloney and David showed that um, looking at uh, time equivalent units in South America is that these time equivalent units seem to be um, um, related to uh, fallen basins in South America, so in the uh, Pampinas, Patagonia type region. And there is an orogenic event uh, called the Famatinian orogenic cycle, which um, is associated here where Patagonia is today. Uh, we had conversion of the Panthalassic plate with the Gondwanan plate. Um, and that the pre-Cordillerian pre event seems to tie up with the Bokefalt, uh, with sedimentation of the Bokefalt group. So I thought, okay, well, that's coincident, uh, the coincidence. And then I thought, oh, well, let me then look at uh, pre-Cape structural features. So these are maps that were made by Tony Tankard, and he shows is that if you look underneath the Cape supergroup, and even if you look at the Cape fold belt, we see that there's this constant trend of reactivation of pre-existing uh, structural trends. And these structural trends seem to mimic the um, envisaged uh, shoreline for the uh, for the Clan William and the Agulhas subbasin. So this is just to show you a diagram, the exact same diagram, but plotting in these structural features. So these structural features seem to be tying up, um, and this needs to be investigated further um, to see if, if that is the case. So in in summary. Um, uh, so I put the question mark over there is that I don't know if uh, even though used to see seems global sea level trends seem to be a controlling factor it's very very dubious until we can actually uh, put an age constraint on on uh, the stuff so I've had my own hand at trying to extract uh, micro fossils using um, using uh, different types of techniques and I've, so far I've been very unsuccessful with it but what I'm doing now is I'm targeting, um, what I've done is I've systematically sampled the Bokefalt group for bed for bed, and I'm looking at the tritle zircons um, in there in the hope that well, my thinking is, is that, well, offshore shales aren't, you know, these are more sediment starved type environments. We do find zircons in there and they are prismatic. There might be a chance that they could be syn sedimentary or volcanic in origin and they might be able to be dated. So. So far, we have been very successful getting those zircons out. It's, we're in the next phase of dating them. So we've got just under 10,000 zircons from the Bokefeld group, or just from that one section. Um, so new models there indicate you know, this Deltaic Del model might not uh, stand the test of time. And if we look at modern shorelines, you look at the east coast of South Africa today, there are very few estuaries. You've got major, mainly beach shore face environments, as with the rest of the world. Um, this transgressive beach barrier, lagoon, and wave influence delta seems to be um, an incised valley fill system uh, type model. Um, if it is, it's, uh, it's possibly the only one known from high paleo latitudes during the Devonian period. So this is quite uh, exciting as well. We've also got four major, f um, four major transgressive phases. Um, and yeah, it's, things are going to happen soon. Um, I just need to date this stuff and then I'll, I'll get back to you on that, um, on that use to see idea. So yeah, that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd like to thank uh, all my sponsors. You know, uh, thanks very much and thanks to Zubair and Bruce for whipping me into shape. Um, so yeah, if it weren't for those guys, uh, I, I probably would still be a perpetual PhD student. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, they're, they're, yeah, it's more, it's better than some other names I've been called. <laughs> so, um, it's quite an impressive piece of work, and, you know, my question is, coming from the point of view of a Precambrian sedimentologist. Yes.
Yes. So my question is, to what extent did your model and, and your, your detailed model, uh, I know that you don't have uh, good dates uh, or good time constraints, but you certainly got very good environmental constraints from the fossil. Yes. So to, so if you had to imagine the same set of rocks with the same exposures and everything else, with no fossil, how much of this story would be able to, would you be able to put together? Yeah. Well, um, last year when I was supervising Nick Weeks, uh, he was working on the White Fulosi formation, or that White Fulosi in Liar. And um, just based on sedimentary structures alone, one can see these, these same stacking patterns over there. So, Hamiki cross stratification, wave ripple lamination, Swaley cross stratification seems to be always tied in with storm wave based activity. So, it's a good paleobathometric indicator. Very large scale uh, trough cross beds, tabular cross beds, which are extensive in outcrop, and you don't see any type of uh, architectural features, so, uh, provided you're not looking at braid plains. Not seeing any of these channelized beds, so if you're looking at fields of dunes that, that are migrating, of course, height is another thing, aerolianites, um, and then also microtextures, I guess, looking at pitting and quartz grains and what have you. It's very, very reliable. It can be replicated on on any type of succession uh, or any siliciclastic succession. Um, the big problem that uh, I think one could come into are, um, is looking at these incised valley fill systems. Um, so uh, I would imagine that uh, if you've got beach barriers that are, being, um, that are being formed, if you don't have plants around, they're not really holding all that sediment together. And I wonder if, um, if a lot of these rocks are in the rock record or, or in the Precambrian record, it's just that we, we're walking over them, we don't see them. Um, so looking at modeling, especially inside valley fill systems in the Precambrian, I think would be very exciting research. Um, so again, with Nick Weeks, is that we think, well, we, we think we found one over there, looking at, again, architecture, looking at the sequence stratigraphy, and looking at stacking patterns, things that disobey Walther's law, and just looking at depositional trends, is that it can be replicated. Um, I just I think I need to get my hands now. I need to st start working deeper in time now uh, to, to try this, play around with it. Yes. Uh, and there could be a number of reasons for that. Firstly, that it's high latitude and plants don't like that. Yeah. Um, secondly, that it's a beach barrier and so there's all of the saline water and plants don't like that. And thirdly, that uh, there probably aren't that many higher land farm communities at that time. Yeah. So which of those do you think is the best explanation uh, for the simple plant communities that you see? Well, the best explanation I've got is climate. Um, so let me just put on this again. Um, is that if you actually look at these climatic belts, um, also if you're looking at the, this is an average ocean temperature, global average ocean temperature, or sea, sea surface temperature has been calculated, is that even though we had high latitudes, it wasn't terribly cold. Um, so I think that, and also for most of the Devonian period, um, there were no ice caps over there. So I, I, it was probably cool, but not cold. So I think these plants, you know, as Ian Malcolm says, life will find a way. So I think <laughs> that's what they did, was that life found a way down there. And it's very interesting now to see these differences as what types of plants persisted. The problem is, is that plants are very dreary things to work on. And we actually need someone to actually go and look at the taxonomy of the plant, these plants again in southwestern Gondwana, just to see why these differences exist. And like with Rob, we, that archaeopterists, all those archaeopterists that he found, I mean, even during, and he's working in the Thamenian, especially where this cold snap comes in leading up to the Great Karoo Ice Age, um, these proto-gymnosperms were living there, seemingly thriving in these environments. So I think South Africa, and we've tried with the isotopes, is that if we could get a reliable temperature estimate at high latitudes, that would be that would be winner winner chicken dinner. So, yeah. Oh, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, and thank you guys for not sleeping and, and attending. Thank you very much.